Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone to CHSRF on Call, which is an interactive series hosted by the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation. CHSRF on Call brings together policymakers, healthcare executives, researchers, and the public and you to be part of a dialogue about ways to improve healthcare for Canadians. We are also pleased to now offer new and improved connectivity options for our entire audience, including new web streaming with integrated audio and video, allowing you to listen through your computer speakers. If at any time during the session you experience technical difficulties, please choose one of the tech support options at the bottom of your screen. On today's call, we're exploring the issue of bulk purchasing and value-based pricing of pharmaceuticals. This follows on a recent uh, report that we commissioned in 2011, and a copy of this report is available on the CHSREF website, which is chsref.ca. We're very pleased to have joining us today Don Hussero, who's adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa, and Eric Lunn, executive director in the Drug Intelligence and Pharmaceutical Services Division at the BC Ministry of Health. Today's call will begin with brief presentations from each of our speakers, and then we're going to open up the lines for a question and answer period uh, when we'll take questions from you. Uh, instructions for taking questions will be provided at the, uh, at the end of the presentations and before we get into the discussion. It's now my pleasure to hand over the floor to Don. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, in the next seven or eight minutes uh, kind of an overview of the report that uh, was um, published on the CHSREF website. Uh, the title of the report was Value-Based Pricing of Pharmaceuticals. Is a pan-Canadian approach feasible? So in this short discussion, I hope to um, uh, give the audience an overview of price and value in the context of drugs, uh, current approaches to pricing and reimbursement, and what uh, one of the problems uh, that's uh, currently facing um, drug plan managers is, and a proposed solution that was given in the report. So price and value um, in purely economic terms are related, especially in a market economy where um, price is a signal uh, that are, is given between uh, consumers and producers uh, and uh, in an attempt to share value. But in uh, the world of drugs, uh, these markets are not perfect. The, the, the people who are receiving uh, drug products are often not the ones uh, paying. The people who are choosing uh, the drugs are not paying. Um, payments are made through pooled risk-sharing agreements, insurance agreements, uh, through large uh, insurers, uh, monopsonist payers. And the folks that are selling the, the products uh, are given a temporary monopoly uh, in order to uh, sell to recoup um, considerable investment uh, that they've made in the drug development process. So the market is far from perfect, and so uh, unlike a perfect market uh, where we might uh, see uh, a price equilibrium occur naturally, uh, in this uh, market prices are, uh, do not occur naturally. Um, so we have to do something uh, about that. And currently, um, the way that producers are approaching pricing is to think about their expected sales, to think about the costs of uh, research and development and the marginal costs of production. Um, at, they need to think about the lower limit that they can charge uh, a price for a good uh, so that they can recoup their investment. But they can also think about an upper limit. What's the ultimate value to a consumer? Uh, and the concept of a value-based price, uh, which is basically uh, looking what's out of the market and then seeing how your new product differentiates itself from existing products, uh, has been a concept that's been around for quite some time. Um, this is opposed to a cost-based price, which is simply uh, a producer charging a price based on their marginal cost of production and then adding on some, uh, some uh, profit margin. And these prices are currently have to consider uh, local prices, regulation, uh, affordability, uh, and there is also a, a large market of international reference prices where prices are regulated uh, through, um, through some uh, reference to other prices being charged in other jurisdictions. On the insurer's side, uh, when we're thinking about reimbursement, the current system heavily relies on formulary systems. And 
formulary systems are, are fairly paternalistic. They, they basically say, we'll either pay for it, we won't pay for it, or, or we'll pay for it with certain conditions. Uh, in Canada, there are also some other uh, drug policies uh, in place, including best price policies, uh, where a jurisdiction will demand the best price, uh, reference prices. There are a couple of programs that have been uh, tried, bulk purchasing uh, or stockpiling, and price negotiation. Um, there is also internationally mechanisms like tendering, uh, which are not used uh, as much for these innovative drugs. So currently, the, the current system looks like this. We have uh, a regulator that approves the use, and we have a patent medicines price review board which reviews uh, the prices and, and pegs them to other international prices, essentially uh, regulating uh, excessive prices. Uh, these then go to um, an evaluative process, a CDR or PCOTR process, and ultimately it's up to the individual provinces or jurisdictional plans to make decisions, uh, largely formulary decisions, uh, although some of them have adopted these new systems of price negotiation. But the problem uh, for the for, uh, is that the formulary systems are a yes list, don't list, so they limit patient choice and they limit provider autonomy. Uh, and they can also distort signals to producers uh, regarding the production of innovative drugs uh, simply by uh, something that is priced uh, quite high compared to its value um, getting on a formulary or something that seems to be a reasonable value not getting on a formulary for reasons other than its value. So um, the, this kinds of inconsistencies uh, can create uh, distorted signals. But the other problem we have in Canada is we're a decentralized system. So uh, listing in one province can put a lot of political pressure on other provinces. And we do have a history of uh, public drug insurers uh, price taking, uh, simply feeling that uh, given the pressure to list that they um, must pay the price uh, that's being asked for by the producer. And some provinces even have a limited ability to negotiate, either uh, limited uh, legal ability uh, or limited simply because um, they're not um, ensuring the volumes uh, that might uh, create an incentive for a producer to sit down and talk about negotiation of price. Um, now we see that the common drug review has become an indirect mechanism of price negotiation. Um, so we may have a recommendation that says, uh, we suggest you list this drug, but at a reduced price. Or we may have a situation where something uh, is rejected or it's suggested that it's not listed uh, because of the price, and then the manufacturer has an opportunity to, to reduce the price. So not a perfect uh, world. The proposed solution that we have in the report is this, that we have a process uh, in place for determining which drugs might require price negotiation. So the proposed solution is coordinated uh, price negotiation across provinces. This would require a process for, for determining which require price negotiation, require explicit criteria that, that tells producers and tells the public what constitutes good value and how the price will reflect this. Um, this coordinated system would require the legislative authority to negotiate a price on behalf of other uh, provincial jurisdictions um, or keep nego and to keep negotiated prices confidential. Um, it would require incentives for the uptake, especially for producers. The system would have to be predictable and it would have to be timely. It would have to be uh, as good or better than the existing system. Um, the solution, uh, a coordinated uh, price negotiation mechanism, uh, would have to consider um, and identify opportunity costs. Um, that includes the health displaced from drug investment decisions. Uh, value, uh, one of the key components of value is if we're going to invest in something, what is it that we are displacing by taking resources that could have been used elsewhere in the system and investing them in the new drug? 
the coordinated system would of price negotiation would have to use rules of price negotiation that are reflective of other markets. It would have to be accountable. Uh, and it would benefit from a reevaluation mechanism. Simply put, uh, there probably is a lot of lost uh, value uh, by drugs entering the system and not being reassessed, either reassessed using traditional technology assessment processes or reassessed using real-world effectiveness mechanisms. Uh, the last thing that it might require is the use of price rebates, to, and this is to avoid uh, essentially um, selling across jurisdiction. Uh, they would also have to uh, consider generic prices because in order for consumers to ultimately get value from innovative drugs, there must be strong and competitive generic markets. So the coordinated system uh, is something that looks like this. Uh, it is simply something that uses existing technology assessment and evaluative processes, like the CDR and PICOTER, but to feed into a, a price negotiation mechanism. And this could also uh, have uh, be associated with um, listing agreements, probably best associated with listing agreements, um, so that the price can also be tied to some uh, real-world metrics of utilization uh, or value. And that's the end of my presentation. Great. Thank you, Don. Terrific. Uh, we'll turn it now over to Eric. Hi. Thanks a lot. So um, I'm, I'm from uh, British Columbia, and I'd like to give a, the perspective from uh, our province. And uh, I think to start one of the, although the title of the session is um, related to bulk purchasing, I won't be actually speaking to that. I don't think Don uh, directly, because uh, most jurisdictions, most drug plans don't directly purchase. Um, so uh, we, we do reimburse. So in terms of uh, the uh, Pharmaceutical Services Division, which I work for, um, we have four main branches, um, and they have different roles. First role is really trying to select the best drug, and um, that is strongly tied to the health technology assessments that Don referred to through the Common Drug Review or other, other mechanisms. The other is a best prescribing, or drug use optimization. We, we do that because we, we feel that on the demand side there is uh, um, important opportunities to optimize that uh, prescribing. The other is on the policies, and this is could be plan structure, it could be how we reimburse, um, and uh, various areas there that we also believe that uh, is very important. And the final group is um, the business branch, and their role is to seek the best deals. And I think you'll see that although BC is structured this way, most jurisdictions have uh, also arranged themselves in, in this sort of way. So when, when we uh, review drugs, uh, the schematic lays out how we generally approach it. We have a review, um, and Don already went through much of this, but uh, we have a review either by CADIS or some other group. Most jurisdictions have their own uh, review process, too, to essentially contextualize that recommendation for the jurisdiction. Uh, we then uh, review that, those recommendations and work towards a decision. Um, and that's where we really get into looking at what value, we're, uh, what value proposition we're, we're faced with. Um, and we, we also uh, have to factor in the various policies or other other planned uh, designs to to actually see where that value is. And if we see value, then we would uh, initiate negotiations. Um, if we do come to decision, then it will either be a regular benefit, a limited coverage benefit, or or covering with certain conditions, or a non-benefit. Um, once we've implemented, then we um, we go into uh, evaluations where we're able to, um, and again to optimize. And if there's any areas in the policy that we'd like to review again, or if there's new drugs, then it goes back to that review process. So at the at the step of determining value, we look at the product, and you know there's two ways to really 
uh, differentiate and, and that competitive advantage um, either cost or the product itself. And when we're looking at differentiation, uh, we do look at the evidence uh, and what the recommendation from our um, advisory committees came up with. Um, it could be specifically tied to an indication, a uh, particular policy, uh, population that was studied, um, and the various efficacy and safety and, and cost effectiveness parameters. And when we're looking at the comparator to, to judge that, we, we do look at obviously other brands, but um, importantly, we do look at what ha of those comparators, you know, what has become generic or is about to become generic. And I think one thing that is, is often overlooked is what other non-drug uh, measures there are. In terms of the value consideration, um, cost is is the obvious one, but uh, cost effectiveness, clinical outcomes is something we we uh, obviously want to look at, but it is something that we struggle with because of the difficulty in measuring them in a real time basis to make those types of decisions. Um, appropriate use, we we do want to uh, add products that um, fit in the overall therapeutic management and and making sure that it's appropriate. Um, budget risk is another. Uh, value consideration and affordability tied to cost. So when we do um, negotiate, the key key one of the key parameters is is the volume parameter, and that's where we we really dive into the clinical coverage criteria and and try to take into account the. Um, oops, did I just get lost? Or okay, there we go. <laughs> um, the um, national approach that Don referred to, I think it, it does make a lot of sense. There are lots of uh, potential benefits um, aligning those funding decisions to, to make access uh, more equitable across, across the country. Um, we're able to leverage our collective buying power and also assist some of those jurisdictions that don't have that, that capacity. Um, by aligning the decisions and the, the coverage criteria, we also can support uh, appropriate use uh, based uh, as we're informed by the evidence and obviously the, the process efficiencies that, that we could gain. Um, very very similar to the drug review process with Common Drug Review, how that uh, got all started. Um, in terms of the commonalities around the jurisdictions, um, we're, we're bound by certain things, so PMPRB uh, setting that max price, we, we have that parameter. Uh, the drug review process is very common, and, and I think um, as all Canadians, we, we do like good deals um, and, and trying to achieve that good value for money that um, we're working for our taxpayers for. The challenges um, with among the jurisdictions, we, we still have uh, differing clinical practices and patient mix. For example, in, for some of the rare diseases, there could be a, a larger population in, in certain jurisdictions. Um, or, um, for example, hepatitis, there are, you know, it's predominantly two, two or three provinces due to immigration patterns. Um, uh, our coverage plan, there's also differences. So, for example, the payer sequence, um, how the deductible works, which level, what age, age category. So when we're trying to look at that value, um, we might look at it slightly differently. Um, as I mentioned, the, the negotiation capacity uh, might also differ. Um, and as, as, a, as a country, we, we don't certainly have a dedicated teams uh, established yet. Uh, the big one um, is spending authority, and this is that each jurisdiction still needs to make their own decision, um, and that's something that we can't delegate. Externally, I think um, industry, they're the, the uh, key partner in, in all of this in terms of bringing in those innovative and value-add products, and, and I'm, uh, one of the uh, potential barriers is the confidentiality of the discussions and the, and the terms and pricing. And I think the, the the one key thing is that well, if if they're being uh, asked to disclose those terms, then then they're really sacrificing potentially larger markets, much larger than than Canada. Uh, other market dynamics: um, we have uh, the generic pricing reforms that are happening, and and you know what is that that uh, comparator price point? Uh, regulatory, um, as Health Canada also looks at how they're they're 
uh, reviewing drugs and, and maybe placing different time points to check on new indications and, and value points, then I think those, those are some things that we don't know yet. So in terms of what next, I, I think that um, there is, value-based pricing does make a lot of sense, and, and many jurisdictions are using that. I think as a collective group, we certainly are, are that is gaining momentum, and um, jurisdictions are looking at how we can do more of it where we can and where it makes sense. I think the value considerations, we, we do want to go beyond just the price um, and looking at outcomes, but I think in many ways we are still handcuffed by some of the data that we have available and, and the difficulty in, in tracking and measuring that. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, and thank you, both Eric and Don. Excellent presentations. Um, I'm happy to open the floor now to the audience for questions. There are two ways that you can pose your questions. Uh, one is electronically by sending the questions in via the box located at the bottom of left of your screen. The other one is by pressing star 1 on your touchtone phone and asking your question verbally. Um, we'll be looking to uh, uh, either of those as we move, either approach as we move into the question and answer period. Uh, operator, are there any questions on the line at this time? Yes, we do have a question. Oh, okay, please go ahead. Our first question comes from Zaina Kayat of CCOR. Please go ahead. Um, hi there. Um, this article in the National Post on Friday, I believe it was, that alluded to some of the themes today, was is, it, is this all still proposal or conceptual, or, or is it happening? Um, sorry, which article are you referring to? In the National Post, there was an article on Friday about the provinces combining forces to do bulk purchasing. Right. Um, well, from the jurisdiction side, there was Council of Federation uh, meeting in um, 2010 that, where the premiers provided direction to the jurisdictions to look into what they dubbed as bulk purchasing. While the terminology is um, not something we do, um, as I mentioned, we are uh, working together to uh, negotiate uh, additional value for certain drug products. Okay, so it's still... So yes, it is live. It's on a per drug basis. It's not a yeah, but it's um, done, you know, um, um, not in a truly coordinated way at this time. It's a bit ad hoc, and so the uh, thought is, well, how if if this is being successful, how do we uh, go about uh, increasing that and increasing capacity and and doing more of that where it makes sense? Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have uh, shown up on screen now. We'll talk, uh, take one of those here. Uh, IARC or Dawn, if you were to take the VBA, which drug or drugs or class of drugs would you start with? Dawn, do you want to take a stab or do you want me to? Yeah, I mean, there's some, so we, we, it's, we allude to it slightly in the report. You have to, there are certain drugs that uh, you may never look at uh, because it doesn't make any sense to negotiate the price, either because the prices are good or because um, within that class, or, or there are other reasons. Uh, there's, there are things that might be just simply off the table for, for reasons. So um, maybe Eric can speak to, uh, you know, some of the work that's been done already. I, I mean, I know that the, the, the first drug uh, that was uh, – described as a, as a bulk purchase, uh, although as Eric has suggested, it wasn't necessarily a purchase, but where a price was negotiated, was the world's most expensive drug, um, Solaris. Uh, so, you know, maybe you want to start with something that uh, has the potential to uh, cost a lot of money, but there are other considerations. Yeah, I would say it, it does vary, um, partly because uh, we, we do need to be selective as to which product, um, and that we, we do try to look at drugs that are coming out of the common drug review. Um, um, 
because it, it is more difficult to work together when, for example, a particular jurisdiction may have already made a decision or have already moved uh, in advance. Um, so it could be a, a drug like the one Don, Don suggested, very high cost. Um, you know, that's a high cost on a per patient basis. It could be a, you know, moderately cost product, but it has a high volume. And then so people would be interested to, to, to uh, explore value uh, propositions there too. So it, it does vary, but the, because of the capacity, we do need to be selective. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question online. That is, uh, Eric, if you could continue with um, the therapeutics initiative offers independent analysis on drug effectiveness and safety. Should this be a national body? Um, it sounds like a BC specific question, but yeah. Um, so currently, we do um, we do continue to um, work with the therapeutics initiative for a few of our drug reviews. Um, a lot of the work that was done previously um, has um, been now, um, with the common drug review, has been uh, assumed by them. Um, so um, the therapeutics initiative, we, we still work with what we call sort of non-common drug review reviews. Um, and I guess whether they should be a national group or not, um, you know, they, they, we certainly value their work. Um, but uh, in terms of the uh, currently the, for the jurisdictions, the go-to group is, is still the common drug review for the more common drug submissions that we get. Um, so I don't know if that answers the um, question or not. Okay. Thanks, Eric. And uh, here's another question. Uh, can you please comment on the potential impact of purchasing strategies on the supply chain and the potential to cause drug shortages? I don't know, uh, would that be Eric? Would you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I can try. I mean, I think the one key difference here is that the, the drugs that we're trying to negotiate are usually single source um, as opposed to the, the generics. And um, product companies that usually generate these products uh, ensure that their supply line are, are really beefed up before they would launch a product. Um, and, and so I, I think while it may occur, I think there was one example where, where it did occur, um, it's quite rare for these single source products to, to have that problem. Thank you. And Eric, while you're on a roll here, uh, we have another one for you. Can you give a, a sense of what proportion of drug costs could be impacted by value-based pricing? Mm, that's a great question. I, I think if you look at the num the percentage of drugs that are generic, um, and how much we spend, you know, forty to fifty percent, then the the other portion would be um, single source items. Um, so the value could be at, at, at that level. But again, due to the capacity to to strike deals, um, we can't deal with brand name products like we would with generic companies, with uh, generic products through through various policy and pricing mechanisms. So it really does um, depend on, uh, in part, the capacity and also uh, um, the willingness for the uh, brand companies to participate. Great. I'm going to yeah. combine a... Oh, go ahead, Don. Yeah, Don, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, you know, the given the, the billions that we spend on drugs just in the public um, insurance plans alone, uh, in Canada, and the fact that, uh, you know, of those billions, you're going to have, uh, you know, the potential to, you know, reduce some net expenditures. But then if you actually think of the downstream consequences, which is incentivizing real innovation and promoting value, uh, you know, you're really getting into, you know, large, uh, uh, there's a large, large potential not only just to impact the health system, but to impact you know, social welfare and the entire uh, amount of spending that goes on in general. Right, exactly. Here, here's a couple of questions. I'm going to combine them because it really goes to the heart of um, who we're talking about when we're talking about a pan-Canadian approach. And so one of the questions is around, do, the pro do you see the provinces being able to purchase uh, drugs in bulk uh, without the involvement of the federal government? And then the uh, related question really is, and what about Quebec? Uh, do we see Quebec as being involved in this kind of uh, pan-Canadian approach 
or, or not, uh, and that's of, um, of relevance to the to this question or given the fact that the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, has a heavy presence in Quebec. So if you, either of you would be interested in commenting on, on that combined question. Well, I just to, I mean, to, the, the provinces are the only ones that are actually paying for um, drugs anyway. There are some federal uh, drug plans, uh, but the federal government has no role in sort of making decisions about purchasing drugs. Um, so, uh, I, you know, saying pan-Canadian is simply saying coordinating uh, those public uh, drug insurance plans that are already doing this work. Uh, Eric, do you have a comment on yeah, that? Yeah, I think um, I think Don's correct. I mean, the, the federal government has their uh, various plans, too, for their federal beneficiaries, uh, veterans, uh, NHB, and others. Um, so they... They also have formularies like we do, but I think their current involvement with agreements is, is limited. I think that's in part because of some of the uh, legal uh, issue, uh, legal parameters that they have to work with. But I, I, I think that they would be interested in, um, in uh, as this might evolve, um, in terms of um, uh, Quebec's participation, um, I think they're, they also are interested. There is another... Um, Pan-Canadian that has taken place in the past that I think is also public, and that's around the Fabry's um, drugs, and uh, Quebec was certainly involved with that. Okay. Yeah, and, and just to add, I mean, price negotiation doesn't, it's not incompatible with, you know, having some industry policy that promotes industry, and Ontario certainly uh, has uh, industry uh, invested and in, still is undertaking price negotiation. Great. Uh, this is probably related in some ways, but what are some of the approaches um, that, the, that the provinces can take that would deal with some of the jurisdictional differences uh, across the country if we are taking a pan-Canadian approach, particularly in negotiation? We know that those uh, are carried on jurisdiction by jurisdiction, so how do we deal with that uh, in, this, uh, in this situation? Either of you want to take a crack at that one? I would just say it's... Go ahead, Eric. Well, oh, I was just going to say, I think um, we we are trying trying to deal with it by having some common uh, benchmarks like the co common drug review, um, and I think that uh, in, in some respects, when we get to uh, differences around criteria and that that there uh, tries to be some compromise, um, but you know clearly uh, there will still uh, be differences just because of how the plans are set up, different population groups. So uh, I think that if, if there's an ability to um, make some compromises, then I think that's probably one of the ways to deal with it. Yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, we have to have good information about what are the opportunity costs in provinces that are have large budgets, provinces that have small budgets, and populations with different uh, demographics. So uh, there would have to be some understanding of what you know, what the value metrics are in, in individual jurisdictions if you're going to come up with a, a pan-Canadian approach. Right. And, again, this is a somewhat related question um, from Kevin Harrington. How do we ensure the confidentiality of negotiations and the final terms are maintained among all the jurisdictions with single-source products? And this is particularly drawing on recent experience, both with Solaris and Pradax. I, I would think uh, that's just simply a legal issue. I mean, there are already uh, pan-Canadian uh, mechanisms of confidentiality around drug and drug policy. The CDR reviews uh, information which is uh, proprietary and confidential. And as far as I know, uh, there's you know that's set a precedent for the fact that those that can happen. And uh, each of the provinces also has or some of the provinces have confidential agreements, and as far as I know, those have remained fairly confidential. Yeah, I think um, two ways to handle confidentiality. One is looking at the information and seeing if that is should be disclosed or not, right? So, um, and, um, you know, there, there's one side that uh, believes that uh, we should disclose everything, 
because it's, it is taxpayers' money, and that, that taxpayer should be aware of what, what is happening. The other side is, is um, keeping what is confidential or, or market or, or uh, market uh, information that is proprietary confidential. Um, and for any agreements that we might strike, there certainly um, are, are legal implications um, if uh, that confidentially is broken. Thank you. And uh, Michael Dietrich from Global Public Affairs asks, with respect to negotiated prices, are manufacturers provided with any coverage guarantee? How can they ensure full provincial uptake on the actual coverage of negotiated prices, that is, the actual price coverage of negotiated prices? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Don, um, or, and you, you can add. I, th I think that is one of the um, uh, limitations of uh, as a reimburser uh, because we don't buy. Um, so it is often based on projected uh, uptake, um, and it really depends also on how your coverage policy may be structured, um, whether there could be, for example, some preferential listing or equal listing or, or other things that would ensure that uh, there would be uptake. Um, but as I mentioned before, we, we do want to also align with appropriate use and and you, you will see that uh, for any drug listing, that that is usually uh, the case for those limited coverage products. Yeah, I think I, I mean, I touched on it in my presentation. This is like a Groupon. If you if you want to get a deal, you better get to the table. But if you get to the table, uh, you have a time limit to offer to to actually uh, implement uh, the price. So uh, I think the idea here is let's improve access. Uh, instead of saying yes or no, let's improve access, but then let's do it for the right price. And those folks that want to be part of that Pan Canadian deal uh, have to then live up to certain obligations. It has to work for everybody. It has to be incentives for everybody. Right. Okay. Uh, we have a question, Eric, for you uh, from Heather McNeil at Health Canada. Uh, the question is, as you know, BC recently introduced the Pharmaceutical Services Act, which creates a legislative framework for BC Pharmacare. Could you please speak to how this will impact bulk purchasing and a value-based approach? Um, yeah, the Pharmacies Act, we're, we're still um, introducing that, and I think the more details will come out once we start developing the regulations. Um, but the potential impact, um, particularly to generic uh, products, is that we will now be able to, uh, by law, legislate um, uh, potentially legislate uh, lower drug prices uh, for that. Um, so it, it gives us that legal framework where previously we were relying on policy. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm not sure which of you would want to take this one on from Ren Jerry at Alberta Health Services, but so the question is, um, are there any proposed changes related to the PMPRB's role in regulating patented drugs as far as the pan-Canadian approach goes? Do you see that? changing. Yeah, so Don here, so we explored it in the report a little bit. I mean, the PMPRB is already reviewing prices. They're looking at international reference prices, and they're also looking at value to some extent, and they're giving price premiums for products that they think offer uh, benefits beyond what's already there. Uh, at the same time, they're a federal body, so they have, you know, a little role in terms of uh, actually, uh, public and in, in public insurance, and then and being a steward for for a public drug plan. Um, so there's a bit of a disconnect there. I think you know if the provinces all bandied together and said that uh, somehow they could make it work within that legal framework, uh, fine. But I don't think that that's realistic. I think this is really we're talking about a pan Canadian approach that's governed uh, by provinces uh, for the most part. Great. Uh, from Bill Dempster at 360 Public Affairs. Uh, for either of you, uh, you mentioned incentives for industry to participate in this approach. Can you please elaborate? What's in it for a supplier to come to the table? Yeah, so what's in it is if they don't come to the table, what are the, the alternative is going to be that they're going to get dragged through a CDR press process where they're told, you know, we're the provinces are being told not to list, not to list, not to list. Uh, then they have to resubmit. So the alternative is 
a much slower and indirect form of price negotiation with recommendations that say, you know, list at a lower price but with no declaration of what that price is. And so there are arbitrary price rules. The alternative is also for a producer to go to each and every province to attempt to negotiate as the provinces sort of ramp up on the negotiation side. So we're seeing sort of a repeat of what we saw with, with before the uh, genesis of CDR, which was the need to go to each jurisdiction individually, uh, uncoordinated, took a lot more time. And the other alternative are, are other pharmaceutical policies like tendering, uh, things that are worse uh, for the industry. So I think this is probably, you know, a very good option for them. Great. Um, we have another question here from Adrienne uh, Filnicki from the Council of Canadians. Uh, if the new trade agreement with the EU, the CETA, is passed, it will affect prices of generics and any health policies not currently in place in Canada. Do you see this as a threat to policies of bulk purchasing and value-based pricing, especially given the EU's desire to protect their pharma companies? Um, Don, do you want to take that stab at that? Well, we didn't really explore it in the report, and I, mm-hmm. you know, I actually am not entirely uh, sure uh, what the impact will be. I mean, we need to have... Um, as I mentioned, a strong generic market in order for something like this to work. But this does apply to these sole source innovative products, these sort of first products. So I'm not sure. Uh, I wouldn't be able to comment further than that. Okay. Eric, do you have a sense of that at all? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of green also in that area, but um, support Don's comments that we, we do uh, want a strong generic uh, market as well. Right. Um, Great. Um, Eric, there's a question for you here. Uh, the, the premiers agreed to look into bulk purchasing in 2010, and where are we at with that? Um, so this is from Pam Foster at the Nurses' Union. Yeah, so I, um, as I mentioned, um, this is uh, being done on an ad hoc basis, and we'd like to get ourselves organized a bit more. Um, and um, so I think the provinces are, are certainly focusing it focusing more on this and, and trying to align efforts, but um, it's still probably not at a, a level where uh, we we can do a lot of products at the same time. Mm-hmm. And this goes to the comment in your presentation, at the very end of your presentation, where you say the pan-Canadian approach is gaining momentum. Uh, is, there, is that encompassed in that, and is there more uh, that you would add to that comment? Um, probably not much more than what I've said because that that is it is where it's at. Um, I think there's a lot of interest, um, but it's just a matter of getting uh, things organized across Canada. And um, and although it might seem um, relatively easy to get a bunch of common buyers together and to coordinate things, it, there is a lot of work that goes behind the scenes to get where we're at. Right, of course. Um, for both of you. Uh, Thinking about, um, Don, you mentioned the need to establish the criteria for what is value, and Eric, you mentioned that value considerations beyond price are important. Could you both elaborate just a little bit more on what you mean by value? Yeah, so there's a section in the report that we basically talk about value. I mean, there are many metrics of value beyond just simply clinical outcomes and uh, costs to the health system. Um, I mean, one of the things that we do value is access. Uh, this this mechanism is attempting to actually improve access, uh, but without uh, incurring, uh, you know, massive opportunity costs. Uh, and there are other things that we might value, like equity, um, so equity of access, uh, or equity uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a disease burden. Um, so there are things that we may consider, like, uh, uh, beyond just... Uh, cost effectiveness, like, you know, is there a real need uh, for this particular drug? And that might be part of the equation. Uh, But, you know, ultimately, as a society, we have to come up with what that equation looks like. Uh, And we have to be careful because the more things we put in it, when we think about opportunity costs, we'll have to consider that for the things that we're displacing. Yeah, from a from a drug plan, what we do, all all we seek is, is this product better than what we have? Um, and so it could be on various fronts, um, the outcomes, the cost, um, 
but but the initial hurdle is that um, clinical evidence um, that the common drug review tries to pull out of it. Um, but yeah, in terms of the value, once we get past that, then we do try to look a little bit broader. Um, what are the health system impacts? Um, are there other intangibles like uh, dosing uh, convenience or, or other things? But uh, it is still benchmarked on, on some of the key uh, evidential bases for, for making these decisions to start that process of exploring additional value. Great. Um, also, uh, Eric, a question for you here from Jerry Wren at Alberta Health Services. Uh, can you comment on the old reference pricing versus the value-based pricing in BC? Right. Uh, reference-based pricing is something that's been around for quite a while, um, and what it does is uh, for a particular drug in a drug class, um, we pick um, a few of the leading products in there, and then we, we peg the price to that product. Um, any other prescriptions for um, other drugs in that class, then we would uh, only pay up to those reference-based products. Uh, we haven't actually uh, changed that much, um, just partly because a lot of the products that are now in those categories have uh, become generic, and, and so we're essentially covering many of those products up to the full cost. So um, where it differs is um, uh, from value-based pricing, value-based is, is based on more unique products um, where there are few uh, products available to treat that particular uh, uh, condition, um, so you don't have a lot of, of other products in there. Um, so that, that's sort of the difference and, and uh, where we see that. Um, A uh, question for either of you, is there a model elsewhere in the world, uh, perhaps for even a particular class of drug, where value-based pricing is working? Yeah, so I mean in the report we discussed uh, where uh, sort of this kind of system is working. I mean there's so many different health jurisdictions that deal with drugs in different ways, but uh, like in Australia, for example, um, the PVAC and the... Uh, their committee to evaluate drugs doesn't simply isn't simply jumping to list no list. There's a there is a price negotiation um, mechanism that's built into there, but it's a national system, so they don't have to have the additional burden of coordination across different systems. Uh, that's probably the the system that's been working the longest at uh, at, at price negotiation. Eric, anything to add to that? Yeah, no. Um, I, I think that the the approach is. Um, I think many people are doing it uh, more than uh, I think most people are aware of. Um, and um, even if you look at uh, any pan Canadian uh, approach, uh, if you look at the hospitals across Canada, they do use group purchasing organizations. Although most of that is focused on um, the generic products. Um, you know, there is some exploration around brand products as well. So, you know, it's been happening in a long time in, in different levels of of the healthcare system um, and internationally, as Don had mentioned. Great. Okay. What about the uh, the engagement of the pharmaceutical industry in the discussions uh, of this issue? Uh, are there existing mechanisms that we have to engage pharma in conversations of the sort, or do we need to create uh, new mechanisms? Don, do you want to start with that? I guess I just, I'm not sure I understand fully the nature of the question. I mean, like, you know, we're having a conversation about value-based pricing. Presumably there's a lot of uh, people that represent the pharmaceutical industry listening and having a conversation right now. So um, is that what we mean? Uh, I think traditionally when these kinds of mechanisms have been developed, like the common drug review, uh, they've been done with, uh, you know, a lot of consultation and uh, coordination. Okay. And Eric, from a provincial perspective? Yeah, provincially, I mean, um, we do have uh, some regular um, bilateral meetings and stakeholder meetings with our, our X&D colleagues. And um, so we, we do talk about various issues. Um, I don't know if we've really focused on this one that much uh, in the recent meetings, but um, I'm sure we will now. Um, but um, <laughs> usually uh, we, we do approach each potential drug um, 
one by one. And so obviously the the uh, the companies that are that are um, uh, affected, um, they uh, I think they there's in general I think they they're very supportive of what we're doing and and they see some value. They there are I think some concerns around. Um, uh, confidentially, as I mentioned, but also the timing of, of you know, this ad- additional process, does it actually um, uh, take longer and, and will it actually stretch things out for access for for um, the patients and their products? So, um, but I think in general, we're, we're so far getting some positive feedback. Great. Okay, I think that will probably be it. We've gone through most of the questions today. I'd like uh, to thank you both very much for uh, a truly excellent session, and we hope, um, and I'm sure that we will be continuing to talk about this in the days to come. And as you mentioned, Eric, uh, through the pan-Canadian conversation that's going to be that's going to be going on over time. Um, to the audience, we hope you'll continue to join us for CHSRF on call. Uh, we have a couple of sessions coming up in the near future. Our next session is on May 24th, where we'll have Stuart Soroka and Ian Brody to discuss health policy. Uh, really discuss Canadians' perceptions of the Canadian healthcare system. And on June 13th, we'll have Don Drummond on call with Livio Di Matteo from Lakehead University, and they'll be discussing the fiscal sustainability of healthcare in Canada. Registration details and more information on these calls and the full CHSRF on call lineup can be found on our website at that chsref.ca slash on call. We encourage you to sign up also for our electronic newsletter at CHSRF where you can stay up to date on both on call and all other CHSRF activities. Again, I'd like to extend a serious thank you to Don and to Eric uh, for uh, a great conversation today as well as the audience with some terrific questions. Uh, We look forward to seeing you again on our next call in May, uh, on the uh, 24th of May. And until then, I'm Stephen Samus. Thanks very much for tuning in today. Bye-bye.